Your Royal Highnesses, we hope that these small tokens will provide you with many fond memories of your visit to our province and of the loyalty and affection which our people have for you. Thank you very much. Mr. Premier, ladies and gentlemen, I don't really know how to uh, thank you enough on behalf of both of us for such kind and generous words to us this evening and also for these marvellous gifts which you've uh, presented us with. I know that uh, our small son will be delightfully wrapped up in his parka. <laughs> and it looks, having had a small glimpse in my box and in my wife's, that we shall make rather a good team, all dressed in the same coloured parkas. <laughs> the only problem is, of course, that uh, we haven't got anything worthwhile really to give you except ourselves and I hope and pray and I hope and pray that that in some way uh, compensates for your great kindness and your generosity and indeed your warm welcome to us uh, here in Newfoundland. Having arrived yesterday in rather more typical, as I suspect it is, <laughs> Newfoundland weather, I wondered, um, also having heard about some of these well-known Newfoundland sayings uh, that uh, I've read about, I wondered rather whether we were going to have um, a warm smoke being better than a cold fog. <laughs> but I see that you've all decided that a warm smoke is also far worse for your health, which I'm delighted to see. But ladies and gentlemen, this is uh, my first visit to Newfoundland, and certainly my wife's. And it is rather nice, for once and for a change, to come to a place together that neither of us have visited. Normally I have been there before. But I've flown over it, on countless occasions, and I've landed, I think, at Gander in the middle of the night, on my way to somewhere, and I've heard stories about the swirling fog banks around the fishing grounds, and about the perils of meeting uh, an iceberg face to face. And now, at last, we have an opportunity of seeing Newfoundland and an iceberg. <laughs> And not only that, but it's another land, or it's a land, uh, another land of Wales. And that gives me particular pleasure, speaking as Prince of Wales. <laughs> I... There's a very interesting wit who lives in Newfoundland who has already got there first, because when we arrived at the airport yesterday, I was presented with a badge, which had a picture of a whale on it, and a welcome to the Prince and Princess of Wales. <laughs> I've got a large collection now, I can assure you, of those sort of badges.
But having heard what the Premier was saying about all the different names that there are in Newfoundland, I'm very sad that I can't take my wife to an amazing place called Leading Tickles West. <laughs> If I did, I have a nasty feeling I might come off worst. <laughs> I try my best to embarrass her in each speech that I make. <laughs> but ladies and gentlemen, just to revert to that iceberg which is sitting out there in the harbour, you won't believe it, but I was looking at a photograph in a newspaper cutting of my great-grandfather's visit here in 1901 when he was Duke of York and Duke of Cornwall. And it was part of his great world tour with my great-grandmother in the HMS Ophir. And they went all over to Australia and South Africa and Canada. And when he was here in 1901, there was this photograph of an iceberg in the entrance to the harbour which looks I promise you, exactly the same shape <laughs> as the one that is here now. For all we know, it may be the same one that's floated out, <laughs> gone up to the north somewhere and eventually drifted back in time for our visit. It seems as though everybody around here has an affection for the crown, I'm delighted to say, including the icebergs. <laughs> King Edward VII. My great-great-grandfather, King Edward VII, also started his tour of Canada in 1860 here in Newfoundland. And when you look back at, at all the old reports, which I've been doing recently, because it, it is rather intriguing to see how things have changed, and in fact how some things haven't changed. For instance, you find a, a newspaper report about King George V's visit here in 1901. Imagine a narrow arm of the sea, girt with lofty hills, crowned with flaring bonfires, the most primitive and most effective form of illumination. Below lay the warships, motionless towers of ele electricity, also the multitudinous fishing craft, their lights swaying to and fro in a gentle ripple. It was a vision of delight. That was one journalist writing about St. John's itself. And then he went on to say that the royal party landed and received a masculine and robust welcome <laughs> from the fishing population. These indeed are a hardy race living their laborious lives contentedly. Further, they are full of naval ardor. Looking back, I'm sure you would all agree, ladies and gentlemen, is fascinating. And it certainly fascinates me. For instance, there was a description of the royal party which was accompanying my great-grandparents so that people in the days before television actually had an idea as to who was who who were riding in the carriages or riding on horseback beside the carriages and so on. Now, in those days, my great-grandfather's private secretary was none other than somebody called Sir Arthur Big, who had been the former private secretary to Queen Victoria, and she had only just recently died. Now the extraordinary coincidence is that uh, <coughs> my private secretary is the grandson of that private secretary. <laughs> and he was described in those days, in this description for people in, in, uh, in St. John's, as r a rosy-faced Englishman of stocky build with a close growing brown moustache. And this scrapbook that uh, Sir Arthur Big kept, and which I have been looking at recently, does give one a fascinating insight into what happened in those days. For instance, the Herald Souvenir of the 1901 visit had a, a picture which had a uh, a, a caption above it saying the oldest colony under the Union Jack and beside it 
was a drawing of a naval reservist with a cutlass in one hand and a pistol in the other, gazing out fiercely from beneath a Union Jack which billowed in the wind behind him. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we all agree things have changed. But we have seen lots of Union Jacks all over St. John's while we've been here. And we've also had an incredibly warm and enthusiastic welcome from, no doubt, the descendants of all those other uh, Newfoundlanders who turned out when my great-grandparents were here. There may not be so much naval ardor nowadays, I'm not sure, but having met some of the wonderful members of the Canadian Legion out there on King George V Stadium this afternoon when I presented new colors to the Royal Newfoundland Regiment, I think there is a certain amount of it still. But there's plenty of that seafaring and fishing ardor about. There is always, I think, a special relationship between two island peoples whose destiny and fortunes are linked so indissolubly with the sea. I think you probably all agree that the sea produces a special breed of people. I spent uh, a certain amount of time in a trawler off the west coast of Scotland a few years ago because I wanted to find out for myself a little bit of what people at sea fishing have to put up with. And I was fascinated by what I found. Even though where we went at that time was short of cod and we had to make do with strange fish that came up from a much greater depth than cod do. But as a result of that, I now have a much greater admiration for what they all endure to keep us well fed. And every time I am given uh, fish, I can't help thinking. And over all these last 400 years, and now we're, I know you're celebrating the 400th anniversary of the founding of the original colony here, I know that it has meant a great deal to you all, and you said so. But what has fascinated me is having been to the other Atlantic uh, provinces recently, learning about the loyalists who came up from what is now the United States, is how they actually did remain loyal despite the appalling things that they had to put up with. And that, I think, is quite extraordinary. And again, makes one wonder how it is that people do cherish these kinds of traditions and indeed that particular kind of heritage. You can't help asking yourself, I can't, sometimes, why is there this apparent and abiding loyalty, which I shall, of course, report back to the Queen when we get home. But I think above all else, it is the, a mutual respect which is so important in any relationship, but particularly, I think, in this one. And as the son of the present sovereign, and bearing in mind all my ancestors who've gone before me, the sense of continuity is enormously strong, and I do feel it very much. Certainly that feeling of inheriting a special trust from someone you love and admire to then cherish the traditions of freedom and the institutions which ultimately guarantee that freedom and enable all of us, and you in particular, to go about your lives in the way you would want to. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for having us here in Newfoundland. <laughs>